Shalom. Today we're going to talk about reconciliation. Reconciliation is a concept that we come to out of our uh, perhaps church understanding. We just want to reconcile the one idea with the uh, Hebrew idea of what reconciliation is. We look in a dictionary, in an English dictionary, we find that reconciliation is the act of making no longer opposed, bringing to acquiescence or acceptance, winning over to friendliness, composing or settling a quarrel, bringing into agreement or harmony, the act of making something good again or repairing it, to bring something together to unite it in in feelings, to make friendly, from a Latin word concilium, which means counsel. And we all agree that this is a condition that we desire, we aspire to with relationship to God, that we could be reconciled to God. In Romans 5, 6 and continuing, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Messiah died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commends his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we are in a state of being opposed to, apart from, opposite God and we want to become reconciled, we want to be made friendly, we want to be brought into harmony with God and this is accomplished by the death of Yeshua. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and following, Therefore, if any man be in Messiah, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Yeshua the Messiah, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, it is the work of the Father to bring us into harmony by Messiah. And then when we become reconciled, we have a ministry to go out and reconcile others. To wit, that God was in Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Messiah, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Messiah's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Every man needs to be reconciled to God. There's only one way to achieve that, and that is through Messiah. And then we need to be out bringing this word of reconciliation, encouraging others to do the same. And then we can be reconciled to each other. The Greek word uh, for, which is usually translated as reconciliation, is uh, katalagi, and this is Strong's 2643. And it literally means an exchange of the business of money traders, exchanging equivalent values, adjustment of a difference, reconciliation, restoration to favor. It comes from a root word katalaso, which means to change or exchange as coins for others of equal value, is always translated as reconcile, except for one exception, and we'll see that when we get to it. So very much we can see if we go to the money trader, we give euros, he gives dollars, we give pesos, he gives yuan. It's one thing of the same value for something else of the same value, but it is a different medium. We can break down uh, katalagi into a prefix, kata, which means according to or alongside, and the verb root, alasso, which means to change one thing for another, to cause one thing to cease and another thing to take its place. In Acts 6.14, we see, we, for we have heard him say that this Yeshua of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. So these are some false witnesses saying that Yeshua said that he would change, make something to cease and make something else take its place. 
But they were false witnesses, and we know that's not what Yeshua said. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Our bodies will take on a different form than, than how they are made now. Nobody knows what that is, but we might find out. There's another word which is translated reconciliation, and it appears in Hebrews 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So this is talking about Yeshua, how he took on flesh and blood of a human being, and his purpose was, again, to make reconciliation. This word reconciliation in the Greek is elaskomai, and it means to placate or appease, to be merciful in a passive sense. We see it in Luke 18.13, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So this has a little bit different feeling. Instead of trading one thing for another, uh, things that are equal value, we see that there's a sense of appeasement. From Elaskomai, we get the word elasterion, which is always translated as mercy seat in the New Testament. Hebrews 9, 5. And over it, the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. And I think we are all aggravated with the person who wrote this book of Hebrews. Why did they not speak more particularly about these things? We want to know about these things. So now we can begin to see how the two concepts, the Old Testament concept and New Testament concept of reconciliation are going to begin to draw together. Um, before we talked about katsalagi and said it's almost always translated as reconciliation except for this one case which is in Romans 5.11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah by whom we now have received the atonement. So here in this one case, this word is translated as atonement. We can see that reconciliation and atonement are parallel concepts. Likewise, in Leviticus 8.15, the word which is usually translated atonement, which we are about to discuss, is translated as reconciliation. And he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. Also in Ezekiel, this word is translated as reconciliation, the Hebrew word, Ezekiel 45. And one lamb out of the flock, out of 200, out of the fat pastures of Israel, for a meat offering, and for a burnt offering, and for peace offerings, to make reconciliation for them, saith the Lord Yahweh. All the people of the land shall give this oblation for the prince in Israel, and it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings, and meat offerings, and drink offerings in the feasts, and in the new moons, and in the Sabbaths, and on all solemnities of the house of Israel, he shall prepare the sin offering, and the meat offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offerings, to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. Yes, Virginia, there will be sacrifices in the millennial kingdom. So you probably know that this word, which is almost always translated as atonement in the Tanakh, is from the, the root from kafar. And you are familiar with the name of the uh, appointed time, 
Yom HaKippurim, which we translated as Day of Atonement. We see in Daniel 9.24, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish a transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The word for atonement is almost always plural. In the Hebrew, it is kippurim. The English word atonement was generated for the translation of the Bible, and it comes from the idea of being at one. Again, going back to the New Testament concept to bring something into harmony. We want to be in harmony with God. We want to have this idea of being at one with him. Exodus 29:36 And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement and thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it and thou shalt anoint it and sanctify it In Exodus 30:16 And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shalt appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before Yahweh to make an atonement for your souls. The altar requires atonement. The people require atonement. This word is also used to mean, uh, uh, it's the actual substance that the ark was covered with, uh, like a pitch or a tar. It has a lot of other meanings also with the idea of covering something. So to to make a bribe or a ransom. We're going to look into those. Genesis 6.14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Psalm 49.7, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Proverbs 16, 14. The wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. There's a way to cover up this kind of problem. Isaiah 6, 7. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Amos 5, 12. For I know your manifold transgressions and your many sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right, or from what is right for the poor people. Again, a bribe is it's a way of pacifying, it's a way of covering up a problem. By extension, this root um, can mean a village. You might know the name uh, Capernaum as a village. Capernaum in Hebrew is Kfar Nachum. It is the village of a man named Nachum. And how it comes to mean the village is that the village covers you and protects you. We also see another translation, which is Camp Fear, which you can see is an exact cognate for Kafar. And Camp Fear is an old name for Henna, which is also something that covers. Song of Songs 711. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Song of Songs 114, My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphire in the vineyards of Engedi. And this is a picture of that plant, of the henna plant. And I believe they take the flowers and they make a dye out of it. And this is something that is done with that dye. I believe these two pictures are from um, India, although it is also practiced in, uh, in some of the Yemeni uh, provinces where the bride has special designs dyed onto her hands and her arm at the time of her wedding and eventually it fades and wash it washes off through continual washing it will fade away you can dye your hair with henna although I'm not sure about wearing this color shirt 
And maybe if you're an old man looking to get a young bride, you want to spruce up your looks, uh, you can dye your hair and your beard with henna. We will continue with this idea of reconciliation in uh, another presentation soon. In the meantime, keep your eyes on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom, shalom.